being in a protected institution like this, getting the best of academics and you just have to pass an examination, that's all. Once you step out, uh, it's another game <laughs> You said that this is the easiest part of life as a students, but we see that uh, a lot of youngsters fall into the clutches of stress, depression and to cope with that they go into the addictions like alcohol, drug, porn, internet etc. And they think that it will give them relief. I didn't know internet was along with the drugs <laughs> So how to deal with them? Look at me, I'm always stoned. never been on a substance, but you must understand, whatever st stimulants, whatever stimulus you may take from outside, essentially human experience of all kinds is caused only from within. The question is only, are you on push start or are you on self start? Which is better technologically? Self start. So, if I teach you, suppose I teach you that you can simply sit here and be totally blissed out, more stoned than anybody on the campus. <laughs> At the same time, you're fully aware, would you go for it? Hmm? Would you go for it? Fully stoned, fully conscious, would you go for it? See, the only problem with your alcohol, drugs, everything is not a moral issue. It is a life issue because it destroys life. It's not a morality that this is good, this is bad, that's not the point. The point is it makes you incapable in so many ways. There was a, a certain Israeli scientist who was researching on marijuana or cannabis over eighteen years, the U.S. Drug and Drug Administration gave him large quantities of marijuana and he went on experimenting and eighteen years time he came up with really nothing significant and uh, during mid-eighties when American agencies were fighting drug on the street, they changed their policy of fighting the suppliers in Mexico and South America, they decided to fight on the street with the users. So they said, uh, somebody said, this is not right, you're giving this man such a big stock, we don't know what he's doing because he's not produced anything, eighteen years of research. Then he moved to Israel. The Israeli government looked at his work and they decided to give him big stocks of marijuana. And after another three and a half, four years, he came up with this. He found that in the human brain, there are millions of cannabis receptors. Then he threw this question to various disciplines. Anthropologists try to look at it and say, at some time in history maybe every human being was smoking, that's why there are receptors. Then they said, this is rubbish because in many parts of the world it was not there. Even an Eskimo has cannabis receptors where he has never seen anything like this. Then various things happened and the neurologists came up with this. They said, always the human brain is waiting for the cannabis, that which causes intoxication. Not waiting for it from outside, it can generate from within, that is why there are receptors. So, this is something that we have always known. I can show you. I'm there always, but <laughs> you look at my eyes, I'm always stoned. But as aware as anybody can be, if you do not know intoxication in life, you will never know a sense of abandon. If you don't have a sense of abandon, you will never walk full stride in your life. You will only walk half steps all the time. Only when there is no fear of suffering because you are highly intoxicated and fully aware, not because you consume substances which will take away your awareness, 
simply because you are keeping the system, the human mechanism at its highest function. Now it is fully self-sufficient, blissed out all the time. Now you will not think of all these things. I'm… I want you to look at this, all young people, I want you to look at this. In your life, would you like to do that which works or that which does not work? Hmm? Human intelligence is always looking for that which works, isn't it? That which does not work is not what we are interested in, that which works. When Just wondering how far to take you, you look like a nice boy <laughs> This is… it is just this. Every experience, whatever happens to you, right now, let's look at it this way. Right now, all of you, those who are in the upper regions also, do you see me? Even if you're not listening, do you see me? <laughs> if you see me, can you use one of your hands and point out where I am? You also. Oh, you got it wrong. You know I'm a mystic. <laughs> From southern India. <laughs> so, today you know, this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the entire story, isn't it? So you see me within yourself, you hear me within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. The way it is projected in the firmament of your mind, you are not seeing the world the way it is, you are seeing it the way it's projected within you. A grasshopper may not be seeing the world the way you see it, he's seeing it differently. Yes or no? Yes. Same world, but he sees, sees it differently because his visual apparatus are made completely different. You know that different animals hear, some hear subsonic sounds, some hear ultrasonic sounds. We… we don't hear both of them, yes? We hear something else. So we are all living in the same world, but seeing and hearing things completely differently. What is day for us, what is light for us, is darkness for some other creature, what is darkness for them is light for us. Obviously, our instruments of perception are created for our survival process and their instruments of survival are crafted for their survival process. But now your intelligence has blossomed to a place where survival is not good enough. You want to know the nature of life. Once this longing comes, then you must understand the instruments of perception need to be enhanced. These instruments, five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching, they are not good enough because they are only instruments of survival. They are not instruments of true knowing because they show you everything in comparison. When I say everything in comparison, right now if you're six feet tall, you stand like a tall man, you walk like a tall man, you think like a tall man, you are a tall man. You went to another society where everybody is eight feet tall. Suddenly you stand like a short man, walk like a short man, think like a short man, you are a short man, isn't it? <laughs> I'm saying what you know in comparison is only good for survival process, not to know the nature of life. So right now, everything that you know is only by comparison. If I touch this, I feel it's cool. No, that's not the reality. The reality is because my body temperature is in a certain way, I make a judgment that this is cool. Suppose I lower my body temperature substantially and then I touch this, this would be warm to me, yes or no? So what you're perceiving is only by comparison. What you know by comparison is just a distortion of reality. It is good enough for survival it is not good enough to know the nature of life. Now you are talking about stress and anxiety. <clears throat> As I said, every year we've been trekking in Himalayas. Two years ago, I'm in a tent somewhere in Nepal. 
and I am doing some work, someone else is cutting an apple. There's another person in the tent, that person tells this person, be careful, it's a very sharp knife. It irritates me because I call something a knife only if it's sharp. What about you all? <laughs> I call something as a knife only if it's really sharp, otherwise I will call it a screwdriver. I look at this and then I continue my work and another two minutes again it is said, be careful it's a very sharp knife. I say, come on, leave the man alone. If it's a child, yes. But this is a gr full grown man, he knows how to handle a knife, not a complicated machinery. So, no Sadhguru, it's a very sharp knife <laughs> Then I continue my work. Another two minutes, I hear a whisper, be careful, it's a very sharp knife <laughs> Another two minutes, he cuts his hand, <laughs> then I give up <laughs> Why I'm saying this to you is, knife is not a sharp instrument, a knife is not a dangerous instrument. Every day in the world, both in terms of kitchens and operation theatres, tell me, are knives saving more lives or taking more lives? saving more lives. In an irresponsible hand, it may take somebody's life. Knife is not dangerous. It is in whose hands it is, what kind of hand is it which makes it dangerous. Knife is not a dangerous instrument, yes or no? Only if an unsteady hand is handling, if a child holds a knife, we say, be careful, be careful because… not because knife is dangerous, because the hand is not steady. Right now, this is the situation. Compared to every other creature on the planet, your intellect is little sharper than them. Would you like to have a sharp intellect or a dull one? Sharp. sharp. If you want a sharp intellect, you must learn to hold it right. Otherwise, every day you start poking, this is self-help, <laughs> you know? When was the last time somebody stabbed you with a dagger in the… <laughs> when was the last time somebody stabbed you with a dagger? <laughs> Even in Delhi it doesn't happen. Maybe somebody poked you with a pin at the most when you were in school or maybe they ignored you, they did not even do that <laughs> So what I am saying is, how much suffering is actually coming from outside? Minuscule, isn't it? Rest is all self-help. So once your intelligence turns against you, believe me, no force in the universe can save you. So it's very important, before you do anything else in your life, you learn to bring your body and mind to a state where your body takes instructions from you. Your mind takes instructions from you. They must serve you, you should not be serving them. Otherwise, you will live a very poor life, very poor life. Because you can only live a life of some significance only when your mind and your body works for you, not against you, isn't it? At least this much every human being should take charge of. <laughs>